Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today's guests are Tom Gabbard, President and CEO of Blumenthal Performing Arts, Jan Kennedy, President and CEO of Performing Arts Fort Worth, it also runs the Bass Performance Hall, and Arva Minosha, President and CEO of Wolf Trap Foundation for the Performing Arts. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webcast guests that you can ask questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. This is so wonderful that, that you're all here uh, today. I know that uh, performance is challenged in this environment, so let's talk about the future of, of live performance, uh, this in-person experience of artists in which we share space, we hear um, uh, the the wonderful sounds of, of our fellow audience uh, members and also what is going on on the stage. Talk about what you're experiencing right now in this time when gathering together is so difficult. And let's start with Tom um, and then, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go to Dion and, and, and Arvin. Tom, what are you experiencing right now? How are you managing? Well, first of all, I think we're all feeling a lot of frustration. You know, we're, we, we're drawn in this profession because we want to be a part of the conversation. We want to be a part of our communities and we know our communities desperately need us. And we're on the sidelines, at least we are. And so there's immense frustration that we can't plunge in the way we normally plunge in. Uh, you know, I think we, we, uh, we've seen this segue from looking primarily at, at, at our venues from COVID to the introduction of Black Lives Matter and, and the necessity to, to begin to rethink all facets of the organization from our presenting to our mission and to our relevance. We're, we're uh, a communication vehicle, aren't we? I mean, we are basically here to engage society on social issues and so much art revolves around that and, and we're beginning to reflect into ourselves. Are we really keeping faith with that mission? Dion, uh, talk a little bit about what is going on in Fort Worth and how you're approaching this COVID time and, and the Black Lives Matter uh, issues of endemic systemic racism uh, in, in this society. How, how are you confronting today's realities? Well, to Tom's point, it, it, it's frustrating because you can't be in front of people. We can't do what we do every day, which is bring people together. But we also have a social responsibility not to try to do that right now either. Um, if anybody's familiar with what's happening in Texas right now, our cases have been um, skyrocketing. And we want to be part of what's helping people understand that we can't gather right now. So. Uh, trying to stay connected with our audiences through other means, whether that's a Zoom chat to explain to them what's going on um, or other content that we can push out just to keep them interested in, in our facility and in our organization. Um, but right now, the important thing is that people remain safe and that our staff remain safe. And so we are actually uh, quiet right now, very quiet as far as our facility goes. Um, but we are using it as a time to do some capital maintenance on the building. Uh, we are lucky, I think, in the fact that we have some endowment and some cash reserves that are allowing us to continue to survive during this time period, while also not requiring us to find ways to force revenue to come in. And Arvind, you have a totally different situation, uh, don't you? You're, you're a national park and you have a different uh, type of facility. How are you managing? Hey, Mark, uh, thank you for having uh, me on the show. And, uh, you know, I, I want to echo what Dion and Tom said. It's, it is obviously very frustrating. And while we do have a different facility in the sense that we uh, operate, you know, our, our, our biggest public facing activity is at the National Park for the Performing Arts or outdoors. Um, you know, being outdoors in this environment is not necessarily the help that one might think. There are certain things that we can do, and you know, small groups, people are enjoying the park and it is still open every day as a resource to the community because it is a national park year round. Um, but you know, we can't do the concerts. We can't, I, I explained to people that, you know, socially distancing in a concert situation is equally hard whether you're a small or large venue because it's just a matter of scale. 
And our theaters have been built with essentially the same architecture for 5,000 years. And there are many, many choke points, whether you're a small theater or a large theater, there's still a stage door, there's still turnstiles to get in, there's still you know, a small hallway leading up to the stage right console to get on stage. These things don't change just because we might have 100 acres of green space around the theater. Uh, but we are uh, trying to, uh, as Dion was saying, stay very connected to our audience, and that can mean many different things. We have pivoted pretty dramatically to a lot of online content, and we are, we are creating new artistic content in the beauty of the park that we are then capturing and pushing out so that people can at least hear music being made in their national park for the arts and be reminded, if not viscerally, but visually of the experience of being out there. Um, and, you know, something that we've done this year is, uh, which I think we might be the only ones, is we've retained our opera training program. And we've taken out the public component of it, but we have actually brought all of our singers from around the country uh, with a very extensive protocol, as you can imagine, around that involving quarantining once they got here to Virginia. Um, but we are finding ways to work with the singers in a very different way than we have in the past, very much on a one-to-one -one basis, a lot of it being outside so that they feel the comfort of not having to deal with a lot of the recirculated uh, air. Uh, and we'll be capturing a lot of that to put out digitally as well. You know, it's, it, it's interesting that uh, where we are today, because in so many respects in our normal activities, uh, we, our agenda is taken up by the imperative of presenting the next performance. Now we are actually having to step back and think very deeply about what the actual role of these organizations are for the arts um, beyond staging the next performance, beyond the operating imperatives. What is the role of an arts institution when it can't operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you have a role to evolve the art, to preserve the art, to uh, connect this, this art to audiences when audiences can't attend? Tom, you wanna give a, give a cut at this? And how, how uh, this, this non-operating activity ought to be uh, preserved so that when we can operate, we have a much richer environment. We, we really have tried to reflect on different ways to do what we always do, which is to build our community and make our community stronger. And we can't convene people, but there are other things that, that we can do. So for instance, very early on, we, we adopted a lot of messaging around masking to try to change public attitudes uh, and, and, to, and to embrace that. We, we have a, a spoken word program that we're very proud of. Our team three times now have been the national champions in, in slam poetry. And on the heels of Black Lives Matter, even though we had a 25 per person, uh, per venue public gathering limitation, I said, the poets need to speak. And so we've been doing poetry slams for 25 people plus Facebook Live because it was a really important time for our poets to speak out about that. So it, you know, it, it, it was an opportunity to reflect on what it was that we do, but find different ways to do it. So you have opera education on the one hand, you have poetry, isn't it the same topic, right? It's the exact it same topic mm -hmm. in, different, in different parts of the country. Dion, what are, what are you doing to ensure that, that the arts continue to evolve? You know, we've had this discussion for a long time that uh, ballet, opera, symphonies are so dominated by white performers, uh, a, a, a repertoire that comes out of Europe. Um, the uh, organizations themselves um, have not necessarily reflected the communities in which they are located. Uh, how are you uh, addressing uh, these kinds of topics in a time when you can't actually operate? Well, that's so true and it's become so apparent um, during the most recent protests and, and uh, very horrific situations that have occurred in our country. And I, I do think that we have a responsibility. Uh, we all have huge education programs and where else does it start besides uh, education in the first place? So uh, one of the things that we're doing is during this time period where we can't have our usual education programs, which do include symphony, opera, and ballet, um, 
who honestly do tend to be, as you described, extremely uh, white uh, in those audiences. And so we are actually, rather than trying to take those programs that we normally do and put them on tape and, and try to get the schools to, to broadcast them, we don't even know what's gonna be happening in schools in a few weeks. So, uh, but instead we are taking those funds and sort of redirecting them into some developing education programs that do focus on uh, black history black history even here in Fort Worth not 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 just nationally but here in Fort Worth and also um, trying to look at issues of systemic racism and how can we incorporate those into online video programs that the schools will accept we've been in contact with um, history and social studies teachers and they're very excited about this opportunity so that's kind of where we're focusing our energy right now. We have a poll going. It's very interesting. We're, we ask people um, whether, uh, uh, how many people are um, going to attend a live performance physically. In other words, come into, into whether it's uh, Wolf Trap or, um, or, um, or Bass or, uh, or any of the other halls around the country within the next 30 days, 90 days, or only once a vaccine is available. And uh, almost 60% um, have, who have responded have said only once the vaccine is available within 30 or 90 days, about the same amount, 20% 40, uh, 40, uh, each. And then we talked about um, the, a live performance using a mobile device or a computer. We have 72% uh, will be using a mobile device or a computer to attend a live performance. And then um, if, if we extend that out, um, it, it actually um, also in increases. So it's very interesting to watch how people are thinking about their own physical safety, but there is consistent connection to live performance. Arvind, as, as, you're, as, as you're trying to morph the programs um, uh, at Wolf Trap, and you talked about the fact that you're doing a lot of online uh, work, um, what we're finding across the country is that the audience is kind of lagging that move to online. Uh, what are you finding in terms of attendance as you're, as you're moving more of your materials online? Um, I think that the metrics that one uses, I think are just vastly and very different and the expectations are very different. And I, and I do think that we're all, at least I'll speak for myself, we have to be thinking of this in um, an iterative way because we haven't fully come to a place where we're not going to be, ever be able to do live concerts again. Mm -hmm. If we got to that place, we'd be having a very different conversation and we'd be exactly. thinking about a timeline in a very different way. We're all still, I think, optimistically of the belief that we will be back, right? Th this is a message that I think is fairly consistent amongst our peers that we might be in an intermission, but the, the show's not over yet. So we are creating opportunities to stay connected, even if the numbers are smaller in the meantime. But I don't know that I would characterize this as an actual shift in strategy, because I think this is a strategy to get through to when we get back. Our objective, and I think responsibilities as people who bring audiences and artists together, is actually to be first and foremost focused on being as strong as we can be next year when we come back, because that is our obligation and our contract to our communities. You've supported us for decades. We're in the long-term business. We are not just a transactional destination. We are a resource to our community. We have to be here next year and we have to plan for that. But the stuff we're doing in between is important and it does provide connectivity it does provide an opportunity for artists to have a platform, but I think the way that we measure numbers, metrics, and goals there is so vastly different that, that it's almost, uh, it's being in a very different business for a very limited period of time. I, you know, I think that's a really good point, I, that we're, we're not going to completely reinvent ourselves over this year or year and a half. Um, but we have to prepare for when we can come back full steam. It's such an important uh, element here. I think what you're, what you're all saying is that we are actually in this intermission, as Arvin put it, we're actually able to look at whether we can use this, this time to develop approaches 
that will complement the time when we're back in the halls um, and, and in the facilities? Um, and, and are there models that we can, um, where we can accelerate the development of this online connectedness? Not, not that we're going to suddenly shift our revenue models, but we can shift how we communicate with audiences before they come into the hall, right, Arvind? Yeah, I mean, I think we're learning. I mean, these are all very good skills to learn. <laughs> They're all the <laughs> things that I think we're all, we all have been doing at various levels and degrees over the years, and we all suddenly had to become much better at it much quicker. And you have, you know, maybe some bandwidth to put all of your energy into that basket for, for once. So yeah, all of this is going to be useful in the future, no doubt. I mean, of course, we're going to, the more ways we can use technology to connect to people, if that augments the in-person but doesn't supplement it, uh, supplant it, I think that's great. And I think we're all going to be in that boat a year from now. Um, do you feel that there will be different alliances formed uh, with uh, streaming services and online services? Uh, I'm thinking of Hamilton. The thing that I was studying, I've, I've watched that show, I don't know, a half dozen times now. And I was studying it from various perspectives. One of the things that I was studying is the uh, on-stage camera work, right? If you take a look at, at, at how that performance was unpacked and the blocking that needed to be done in order to allow the actors to move as they did. And I saw that, that show on Broadway twice and, off, and um, you know, as it was traveling uh, once. So I was very familiar with the in-person experience from one seat. And then you see how the camera work functioned in a way that allowed that performance to take place it, so that the actors were untethered, um, but but the the viewer from from our perspective could actually see that type of theatrical experience. That is a very sophisticated skill set, and no performing arts center has the funding to keep that skill set on on staff. Are you thinking about um, uh, longer term? Um, alliances and, and associations that previously were perhaps less important, but now might be part and parcel of how you operate in the future? How, how are you thinking about this? Uh, Tom? I, I will say we, we really have not embraced the online degree others have because we are focused 24 seven in how we reactivate live. But I think you raise a good point uh, that, that particularly when the quality is there as it was with Hamilton, it makes those more compelling. Uh, you know, in, in the US, we, we unfortunately have some huge obstacles with the unions to overcome. And, and, and I do think, you know, it's gonna be harder for us to maintain that quality than it is, for instance, in the UK, where the National Theater has had a terrific theater series, but the union agreements are markedly different. And so, you know, I think that that is something that, that hopefully over time can be improved. Yana, are you, are you finding um, a, a changes in terms of how you're thinking about alliances or is this, is this uh, thought process just beginning as you concentrate on, on finding ways to uh, open up uh, going, going forward? So when, when we think about opening up, I'll, uh, I'll sort of reiterate what Tom said, that uh, our focus right now is uh, one thing is about education and what we can do this year for education. The next is about opening up live and being able to be there live. So, you know, one of the questions in the chat box is about what are we thinking about in order to ensure that audiences feel safe coming back? So those are the strategies that we're working on now. What will we be doing? How will we communicate those strategies? How do we get people to understand that it is safe to come back? We do know there are examples of people presenting live performances um, with full audiences without social distancing and, and remaining safe. But we have to learn to, how to implement those strategies successfully so that people can come back. And we can already see here in Texas where just a couple of weeks ago, finally, a mask ordinance was enforced. Um, and within two weeks, we're already starting to see reports about how that is starting to reduce the number of new cases every day. So that's something that we've known for months now that needs to happen. And as Tom was saying, they were they were trying to educate their audience about it already. So 
that's something that's going to have to be done if we are going to come back into our theaters and have live performances, but not just masks. There are many, many other things, touchless ticketing, um, how do we seat patrons, how do we clean the venues, what kind of air filter systems do we have in our facilities, what are the things that we're doing that will protect you as a patron when you come back in the door? So that's really what we're spending a lot of time on. We have a team that meets at least once a week about that from all across departments about what we're doing in each department and how we're going to implement it. Mark, if I can add to what you're saying there, I, <clears throat> I really think that we have a pivotal role to play in helping to restore public trust. We need to understand coming out of this that public trust in institutions is, is likely at an all-time low. I, I was listening to a, the, the, the Daily on New York Times, and they were reporting that 50% of people don't trust a vaccine. We could have a vaccine in a few months, and 50% will not take it because they don't trust. And, and so I think our institutions have an incredible role to play to begin to restore public confidence in our community, in our government, uh, and, and that we can be spokespersons to help, you know, bring our communities back together and restore public trust. In terms of, of, of that uh, shift, um, it seems that we are also um, emphasizing things that perhaps had not been as emphasized before. There's a communication piece that's associated with public trust. How do you get messages out? And then education seems to be the, the thing that you each have raised over and over again. And education can sometimes be seen as, as the secondary uh, responsibility of a, of a performing arts center, but now education is, is coming front and center. Are you shifting how you, how you uh, focus on education and communications um, at, uh, as, as part of your response strategy to COVID, um, are you placing more emphasis in, in terms of the whole team on those two aspects of, of your work? Arvind, do you wanna take a cut at this? Uh, sure, um, you know, education has always been a pretty central component of what we do and, and we, our model is very much in, our, in the thrust of our major education program is to teach the teachers. You know, we're more on the wholesale side where we do teacher training so that they can take whatever curricular objectives and, and, and lesson plans that they've developed in their own classroom for their own community that is relevant to their population uh, and then use the arts and to enrich that, that, that process. That is a nationwide process that we, that we run out of our national office here in Virginia. And you know, it's been one of the places that has been in some ways the most natural to pivot to uh, distance learning and remote delivery. And so we've been able to maintain or retain, you know, really the majority of that institute's work because all of the teachers that are, are typically involved in the network are also involved in distance learning in their own community, of course. And so, you know, that, that whole shift happened very overnight because it had to. And it's one of the places where, because we're doing one-on-one, -on -one, often one-on-one -on -one work with a teacher it can happen remotely as well. So for us, it's been nice to be able to do that pivot and it gives uh, our education institute and team, you know, a lot of very meaty work and a lot for us to talk about and for us as a general team to support. Um, do we want to go back to the in-classroom model? Of course we do. I mean, we want to be in, in front of people in the way that everybody wants to have that human connection, but uh, we definitely see it as a, a real focus of the work of the, of the foundation at the moment and uh, you know, in some ways, very grateful that we've had so many years under our belt so that we could pivot so quickly and retain the national network almost entirely. One of the questions that, that was asked by uh, Rachel Cooper of the Asia Society has to do with international performances. Um, we have uh, provided exposure to, um, to uh, international artists through our stage. Now, the one thing that, that the internet can definitely do better than um, than um, almost anything else is to connect people internationally without reference to geography. Um, are you developing uh, approaches that will allow um, you to connect internationally to artists during this time? Or is that type of, of activity, because we can't do the live performance and have international audiences uh, connect, is that taking a back burner at this time? 
I, I would say uh, definitely um, we have not gone to the paywall example that a lot of people are using to present artists. And so strictly from a financial standpoint, trying to do that at a time when you're seeing no other revenue come in is very difficult. Um, I'll say we, we also don't present a lot of international artists ourselves. We own and operate the building and we present touring productions here in our building, but we primarily focus on Broadway and concerts, um, very commercially oriented work because we have resident companies, Symphony, Opera, Ballet, and the Clyburn. And the Clyburn, if you're familiar with them, does an international piano competition every four years. It's one of the uh, most prestigious in the world, actually. And this is the year, 21, spring of 21 is their year. And uh, so that is a program that is uh, internationally broadcast. Um, and it's, it's a really, they get a tremendous amount of viewership across the world with international performers, of course, from everywhere as well. So it's a wonderful way to get our building exposed but I admit that we as a presenter aren't the ones who are bringing those in. It is the Clyburn, so we're very lucky to have them bringing that into our building every four years. That's it. But we don't know if it'll happen this year. I mean, the, the honest truth is they have every intent of doing it, um, but it will probably be a few more months before we know whether international artists will be able to travel here and the Clyburn is very adamant that they want it to be done in person and 100% audience capacity. They feel like that is a really important piece of the competition, being live and in person and having a full audience. So we fully support that and we're in the same boat. Uh, uh, Tom and I are in the same boat with touring Broadway until there is 100% capacity permitted without social distancing. There are shows that we just can't do. So let's talk about, uh, about some of the positive news here. We have a huge demand for live, a huge pent up demand mm -hmm. for live. And that demand is going to hit us all at once. When we get a vaccine um, and people feel safer, and let's assume, Tom, that, that we actually have people, all of us are taking it to protect each other, uh, we're going to have huge audiences. And it looks like there are hopeful signs that perhaps uh, in the spring, perhaps by March, uh, we'll, we'll hit that, that place. How are you thinking of, of reopening, Arvind? Um, how, do, how do you think about, about that time? And, and, and is that time frame that I'm, that I'm proposing uh, the way you're thinking, or am I being too optimistic? No, that's the way we're thinking. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think we have to be optimistic on some level. You have to plan on reopening in some reasonable amount of time. If the idea was that we don't think we're gonna reopen for five years, then I think really we're all mothballed until that period. We're not there yet, at least I'm not ready to, to give that up yet. We are also, I am also thinking very much about spring of next year. Um, we are absolutely planning on having Concerts not only in our small theater in uh, the spring of next year, but really mainly in our large outdoor theater for next summer. And, and we are absolutely putting those plans in place. We are going to go full steam ahead. We have a lot of artists already committed to next summer. I think there's, a, to your point, a lot of enthusiasm within the industry of making sure that we've really planned a big year for next year because we are gonna all come back and society is gonna need to be out amongst each other in front of their favorite artists again. That is something that has not left our hearts just yet. We're going to want to do that. This is where we can use this pent up demand to address those issues of, of diversifying the audience and, and getting younger people into a conversation with, with, with artists and with that live performance. Dion, and then we'll, and then we'll uh, end up with Tom. Dion, you want to give a cut at this? Actually, right now, everything from January on is still on the books. We realize that January is still tenuous, and so we are basically rolling with the punches, and I think that's what we've been doing since March. We, uh, at, In March, it was more like a day-to-day -day or, or every couple of weeks. Now it has extended to every two or three months. We're looking at it in sections like that. Uh, we are heavily, heavily into booking for the 21-22 season, absolutely. Uh, have a full season booked for that. 
And we hope that what we have in the remainder uh, or the first half of 21 will at least partially be um, possible. And the important thing is planning for that and what we can do to be prepared and make sure that it's safe and healthy for people when they come. And Tom, how are you looking at it? We're, uh, we're, we're cautiously optimistic that we may see some activity by the end, end of this year, so in the fall. Uh, we, you know, we spent a lot of time studying a, a super hygiene model they use in Korea where the big musicals never stopped. Phantom of the Opera has played throughout this uh, pandemic using a super hygiene model. But I think more realistically, uh, I, 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 we're expecting there could be some rapid testing solutions that, that will be out there. Testing is such a problem now, I know it sounds crazy, but in the FDA approval pipeline uh, are, are dozens and dozens of rapid testing solutions. So I've been part of a small working group working with the NBA and others to look at rapid testing solutions where we could theoretically test the entire audience. And so I think that type of rapid testing solution could be a bridge, uh, not the permanent solution, the vaccine is a permanent solution, but it could help us to begin to reactivate as early as late fall. Well, it's wonderful that uh, to hear about the various creative ways in which you're each and, and with fortitude uh, responding to this pandemic. It's only with fortitude, with determination, with an adherence to the idea of the importance of art as a communication vehicle, as a vehicle of joy, that we will get through this. Thank you all. And thank your staffs. Thank your staff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank Absolutely. our artists for all the work that they are doing on our behalf. That's the nonprofit report. Thank you attendees for coming. Uh, please keep the energy going and have a great day. Stay socially distant, stay safe.